Hi, hi, I, I just started recording. Oh, perfect. Thank um, you very so, much. Yeah. So welcome everybody. Delta Talks number eight or nine. Um, great discussion that we've had so far. Last uh, month we had Delta Talks live, which was even a little bit better. Today again back online and you know it's a webinar series hosted by uh, Wageningen University and the Asian Mega Deltas Initiative. Um, today, we have a, uh, an interesting talk around inclusive water governance in Bangladesh, uh, and I will uh, hand it over to Deepa to give a quick introduction in a minute. But Mariana, would you like to say a few words from Wageningen? Oh, I'm happy that we have uh, again this Delta talk uh, whose number we still <laughs> are to discover. And uh, it's it's very nice to uh, to have a now talk uh, about governance in, in Bangladesh. Uh, I'm very much looking forward. We or, already earlier had uh, Delta talks uh, on governance issues. So I'm really curious to now hear what we will learn from Bangladesh. I'm looking forward. Uh, the presentation and the discussion afterwards. So do I, and in order to have enough discussion time, uh, that should be enough from us. Deepa, would you like to give a brief introduction and then hand it over to the speaker for today? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. This is Deepa Joshi, and uh, welcome. And um, your the focus of um, work package four of the Asia Mega Deltas is on inclusive governance, and and particularly our focus has been in understanding why Bangladesh has fairly progressive policies on inclusive governance, but we don't often see the outcomes of these processes on the ground. So what? What are the barriers? What are the challenges? What needs to change um, in order to move um, from uh, policies that are, um, you know, quite progressive to ground realities that seem very resistant to change? So, without further ado, um, I would invite my colleagues who will be uh, presenting. Indu Sharma is part of the Asia Mega Deltas team and works at the International Water Management Institute. Moklesh um, Rehman is um, the director of the um, organization uh, Center for Natural Resources Studies based in Bangladesh. And we have also uh, Shanta Soheli Moina who works with Oxfam Bangladesh. And I think what is also interesting about this particular um, joint presentation is that we are working very closely with uh, CNRS and Oxfam and really trying to see how the research in AMD can leverage some policy outcomes and impact on the ground through the Oxfam Trosa phase two project. So over to you, Indu, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Deepa, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very much pleased to be a part of this uh, Delta Talks. Um, so I'm just going to share the screen. Um, yeah, I hope that the screen can be is visible. Uh, Yes, the screen is visible. Isn't yes, it? thank yeah, thank you so much. So uh, as Deepa mentioned, we are focusing more on the inclusive water governance uh, in Bangladesh. So for the next 20 minutes, we'll walk over uh, starting with the agri-food system governance as a whole. What does it mean like in the distinguishing between the policies and the practice? And then after that, we'll uh, dig deep more into the water governance from the agri-food system. Looking at the real challenges from the field, we'll hear from Dr. Moklis from CNRS. And the, the third topic would be to really highlighting three key issues that is affecting the implementation. And finally, we'll talk about how the research uh, will impact the overall, uh, you know, like the, the TROSA activity that Oxfam and CNRS are doing. 
Um, so here, uh, talking about the agri-food governance, uh, like uh, last year, World Package 4, we developed the governance matrix. And that includes four, seven different dimensions of inclusive governance. So using the same framework, we reviewed 23 different policies on agriculture, food system, climate change, and natural resource management to look into how they are inclusive of gender and you know, different social aspects. Um, so as Deepa mentioned uh, briefly, we found that uh, Bangladesh is very much going into this strategic shift in, the, in terms of inclusive policies in climate resilient and agri for system sphere. However, these policies significantly differ on their focus on social inclusion and gender uh, inequality and as very much fragmented across different sectors. Um, so there is still considerable disconnect between what we experience from the field, the issues of agri-food agri and then uh, in between the expert-led innovations that are implemented. Um, there have been a lot of structural uh, power hierarchies and other barriers that exclude women and marginalized groups in participating in accessing different resources. And uh, one of the key findings is that there are a lot of, you know, like we have really good policies, however, um, the accompanying guidelines are really missing. Uh, and then also it also leads to a lack of, you know, monitoring evaluation of kind of mechanisms. So the uh, question for us is to really on how do we change the status from, you know, like making policies and then to this uh, narrowing this divide between policies and practice gap. Um, so in the next slide, uh, I would like to request Dr. Moklis from CNRS to talk about the field level challenges focusing on uh, achieving inclusive water governance uh, from uh, his experience. Over to you, Dr. Moklis. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Indu. Uh, please put my slide on. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, good morning and uh, maybe good afternoon. <laughs> um, actually, uh, we're talk going to talk about the Shatkira area, which is uh, located at the southwestern part of Bangladesh. Um, also represents the lower Ganges Delta. And the place is very close to the Sundarbans mangrove forest, which is shared between India and Bangladesh. Um, the historically Shatkira area is, Shatkira and Kulna area uh, is uh, impacted by high salinity, soil and water salinity, uh, because of various factors. Um, we see uh, now people blame and claim climate change is the factor that actually increasing the salinity. Maybe true, but a little. Uh, what we have experienced working there for maybe about 20 years, that uh, the contextual issues, the policy related things like leasing of cost lands and government owned land and wetlands, canal networks, uh, the massive stream farming and the elite dominance of uh, state owned resources, privatization of uh, common pool resources are basically the main drivers of this uh, freshwater scarcity and uh, high salinity, uh, which impact the production systems. So we, we want to address, which we need to focus more on addressing the contextual issues rather than climate. It will come automatically, I guess. Um, the other thing is um, there are, especially if we group the uh, drivers, some are endogenous locally. So the changes happened at the local level, which is why the elite dominance is very important and very robust, and conversion and privatization of canals. And canal is basically the only uh, kind of uh, land uh, water resource that could store rainwater, which is fresh water, and people can diversify crops and increase the cropping intensity and uh, particularly during the dry season, they can grow varieties of crops. Uh, the dry season is the best uh, season for us to uh, diversify crops, but because of the high salinity, they cannot grow. So the land is only used for the monsoon season uh, when the rainwater is there and the salinity dilutes and that people can grow almond rice or monsoon rice. Um, so uh, this 
endogenous thing is also like the conflicts between the uh, sheep farmers and uh, rice farmers and uh, denial of poor people access to leased canals. About 90 percent uh, canals are either leased out and controlled by the leaseholders or elite capture. So hardly any scope for the poor people and the marginalized farmers to use what are including women and young. Um, so these are basically uh, the key endogenous issues. And from the exogenous part, the policy, the wetland leasing policy. Um, since the area is freshwater and scarce, the government should have taken a special measures to protect the uh, canals to store rainwater so that people can diversify their food systems. And this also supports capture fishing. But, you know, things are not happening. It is given to few people and they are converting it, doing aquaculture, making houses, settlements. So there are examples of permanent loss of canals. There is no trace in the map. So that sort of things happening. The other thing is this massive shrimp farming. It is also unplanned. And our policy, shrimp policy said that it has to be, uh, there has to be a zoning where people do shrimp farming, uh, saltwater shrimp farming, and in areas where people do rice farming. So there's a demand from the locality, but particularly from the rice farming communities, but things are not happening because of various political and other technical issues. Um, the coastal embankments, sluice gates and other structures, some are functioning, not functioning, and uh, somewhat unplanned. And this also cause, you know, kind of water logging, sedimentation, flooding, and production loss. The climate change, of course, it is there, uh, particularly the prolonged drought. Now we are having drought, but in some last three years, we are having uh, early monsoon flooding, rain-based flooding. So because of the canals are converted, and many canals are uh, grabbed by the stream farmers, so drainage is a big problem. So under the climate change, we are having erratic rainfalls. So sometimes people suffer from water logging, uh, particularly during almond rice farming system. Um, so this is uh, because of the embankments and uh, canal uh, not properly supporting the drainage. Um, uh, other thing is the uh, obstruction of water or withdrawal of water from the river systems upstream, that's within Bangladesh and beyond. And there is hardly any practical or pragmatic initiative to uh, actually restore the canals, cancelling the leasing and uh, protecting water and a kind of community-based management of canal resources for food production. It's not there. So in the next slide, um, I just like to, as a testimony, like to show, Indu, can you move to the next one? Yeah. So the left uh, couple of photos uh, you can see, this, this is the uh, the first part of the Kuntoli Canal coming out of the Malancho River. That river actually uh, uh, in between the settlements and the Sundarbans. It's very close to Sundarbans. And the households living at the banks of the canal they are slowly kind of grabbing the canals by making ponds. And in front of everyone, nobody is protecting this. So this is best. This is the way that people uh, actually grab uh, government-owned land. And I guess we well, raise this point to the deputy commissioner, but nobody is listening to this. And I guess in the next 20 years, this very good canal would turn into a small train or narrow train. And then uh, it would be a kind of irreversible loss to state-owned resources or common pool resources. The right one is a canal. This part of the canal is, uh, it is a branch of the Kultuli Canal. Um, uh, it is leased out many years back. So now there is hardly any trace. So it is completely converted to, uh, largely converted to cropland. So people here, suffer from water shortage in the dry season, so they can only grow monsoon rice when there is rainwater and no survivability. So, yeah, now um, move on to the third one, third slide, Indo. 
Yeah. Another, some of the photos of uh, another, a branch of Kultulikhal, which is we call Kochukalikhal, where uh, Deepa, uh, Mo, and I visited last year, or last, uh, this month. Yeah. Here, actually, the, it's a large canal, and I had a good opportunity to store huge volume of water for the farming and uh, other purposes, fishing and farming, livestock, duck rearing, this and that, but these are leased. So in this area, the leaseholders, they don't allow people to use fetch water and use for other purposes. So they strongly maintain this. And it oh, is uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Also... just to remind, we have three more minutes, so just to uh, uh, kind of request. To All right, I'm just finishing, finishing. Yeah, finish. exactly. yeah. so these are the testimonies that how uh, the water systems available in you know, based on canals are uh, are actually grabbed by the uh, people due to policy and political influences, and how the local people, the mass people, are excluded from these resources. The next one, this is the last one. Good news. Yeah. So there are several policies aligned to these water systems. Uh, there may be some more. These policies basically are interconnected, interlinked. But in reality, on the ground, they are separated, isolated, and applied in siloed, siloed approach. So uh, we really want a kind of coherent policy for addressing the water, uh, biodiversity or agri-diversity, the land productivity, this and that including the fishing and fisheries and aquaculture, but things are not happening in that way. It's a big problem for us. And uh, the, the problems and issues of the local level is not transmitted to the central level, to, to the policy stakeholders, to the managers uh, at the central level. So we experience that and we suggest that we need to work at both ends. At the local level, communities should be organized because they are actually not well organized, not well aware. Uh, they are impacted, affected, but cannot take decisions what to do. So work with them, build their capacity and uh, kind of uh, making the movements so that they can influence local authorities and actors. And also we need to work at the policy level to influence them uh, through evidence what is happening and what could be possible to better manage the water systems for food production. So this is what that um, actually we suggest through workshops and dialogues and policy briefings and sharing and making alleys. It is not that someone only CNRS or only water development board or fisheries or agriculture alone. We need a collective approach. So I want to end here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mokles. Uh, and now, like, uh, I would like to focus on three key challenges that we found from our recent uh, literature review on water governance issues. Uh, the first one on the power and hierarchy, how it saves the historical water management intervention. As Dr. Mokles just pointed out, it is not only the climate you know, regions that affects water governance and inclusion. So uh, we looked historically into key intervention, and we uh, would like to focus on two key interventions that Bangladesh uh, you know, had focused on. The first one is the folders. Like in 1960s, there, there were like uh, 139 folders were constructed to address this flooding risk and enhance agriculture production. And the second key intervention was a transition towards extensive stream farming that expanded by over, like, you know, the stream farming area was expanded by over 400%. And then uh, initially, like there was a lot of, you know, there have been positive effects that, for example, the polders, they contributed to flood prevention, control of salinity intrusion. And it did actually bring uh, 1.2 million hectares of land under agricultural production. And the stream farming, because it contributed a lot to economic, uh, in, you know, like the boosting the economy. And uh, even in the data from 2020, uh, 2012 to 2013, so that it was the second largest export industry after garment. 
So uh, there have been the positive effect. However, uh, there have been some serious ecological challenges. For example, in terms of polders, over 600 kilometers of the major waterways were obstructed. There have been sedimentation and some of the rivers also died. Uh, stream farming, there was the clearance of a lot of land of the mangroves and other, you know, like the, uh, some of the studies indicate up to five-fold increase in soil and water salinity. Um, so, however, like what we focus here is there have been more far-reaching social impacts uh, in different population groups. For example, if we look at the smallholder farmers, they had to lose you know, a lot of land. Uh, this particular case we found from Adnan is that in Paigatsa is one of the sub-districts in Kula district, where 84% of the residents, they had to lose their land because of proliferation of a commercial stream farming. Um, the fishers livelihood was also affected to hear fishers means we want to focus on the captured fisheries. Um, there had been the substantial decline in the fish catch uh, because of this investment and um, for example, as you can see there, like uh, one of the studies from one specific location, like uh, we cited that example that 95% of fishing areas would cease for stream farming, uh, leaving only 5% of these fishers to use those resources. Uh, there have been implications for waste laborers, like uh, as we, uh, there are a lot of studies that say that uh, stream farming is less labor intensive than rice farming. Uh, it's like this is the particular study from Shamim that highlights that cultivating rice on 40 hectares of land uh, employs safety workers where it's only five from there. And then there have been the worst consequences uh, reported uh, in terms of displacement and migration because of unplanned and unregulated stream farming, for example, in South Kira, out there as the examples. And so the, the second issue is, so what was the, you know, the behind it? So we, we really highlighted the local power dynamics and water governance to see at the two issues, the power dynamics, so you mean to say like, you know, how this interaction between individuals because of their power that affects the distribution and control of these resources. Um, so three key uh, power dynamics were highlighted from the literature that one is uh, based on the resource ownership, for example, right to water is considered as right to land, like the land ownership, and also uh, similar for like you know, these large land owners dominate a lot of water resources. The second we found was in terms of gender, in terms of men versus women's role, and then how women are excluded from water management. Uh, the third is uh, those who are close to politically elected representatives, they could use more these water resources. So these are the power dynamics that affect uh, this uh, inclusive governance. However, looking at the, the governance structure, like uh, we focus on two different aspects, one from the water aspect that has really good policy safety in 1990s on inclusive you know, participatory water management that focus on these different aspects for multiple livelihoods, not only producers, but also land -lish, fishers and others. However, uh, these different projects, uh, uh, there have been very much limited community participation and there is no mechanisms to monitor uh, where they participate and what is, you know, like high, to what extent. And in terms of multi-sector policies, as Mokles, uh, Dr. Mokles was referring, water sector is not only about water, but also it relates to all other sectors and multi-sectoral interests. However, on the ground, there has been um, so, Indu, I, I just want to um, add here that you have another two minutes, so the last speaker gets adequate time. Please okay, put in rush you so your yeah, next slides. Yeah, thank you so much, Deepa. Okay, so these two uh, issues and the final one what, what we want to highlight here is that uh, because there are some, you know, institutional and culture and practices that save unequal power dynamics. Uh, we give the examples from women's exclusion, elite capture, a lot of uh, uh, aspects on the elite capture has been already uh, you know, presented by Dr. Mokle. So what we want to highlight here is there have been uh, some kind of you know, institutional barriers, for example, this significant gender waste disparities in terms of women as they receive almost half that of men and also the elite capture there as the barriers that, you know, like not only in water, but also land and the canal and other grabbing. So that leads to the exclusion. Uh, of these marginalized and other populations. So based on these three issues and this context, uh, we are working with the TROSA project uh, on the Transboundary River Asia, Rivers of South Asia project with Oxfam and CNRS to gain insights into the integrating of, you know, like the, how this gender equality and social inclusion is integrated and what we can do to empower women and marginalized populations to increase their access to and participation in water resources. As you can see, we focus on 
some three different research questions. First, looking into different sectoral and institutional dynamics. Um, and then the second, really looking into their access to common pool water resources for multiple livelihoods. Uh, and then the third is looking into the power dynamics and how they participate in decision making and what can we do about this uh, going forward. So uh, this is the slide where we uh, want to highlight like how this evidence will uh, contribute to the TROSA project's impact. Um, so we, as you can see there, we focus on a lot of evidence, the literature reviews, case studies, and then uh, we highlight like three key uh, entry points where we can make a change. First, really looking into the not debate specific intervention of the project, and then at the national level advocacy, sub-district and district level advocacy, and the, the campaigns. Um, so that eventually in the outcome. Okay, we Indu, I think we need to hand over to Moina, please. Yeah, because yeah, she sure. can yeah, take on yeah, from thank you. Yeah, so yeah, so we uh, we want to reach to two different outcomes highlighted before, like one is at the marginalized, uh, you know, the population level to work on the advocacy, empowering and you know the capacity. And second is the institutional level that they really understand these kind of issues. Uh, so I would like to request uh, Moina from Oxfam uh, to talk more about cross-up approach and how we will be working uh, together and doing that uh, the policy and practice uh, aspects. Over to you, Moina. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Indu, and thank you, Mukla, sir. So uh, since 2017, Oxfam Marine's partners have been working for inclusive water governance through TROSA water governance program. Uh, if you see uh, in the next slides, then so I'd like to uh, highlight that TROSA have be, has been working to address these under, the underlying causes of poverty and marginalization uh, of the people living in the transboundary river basins of GBM, and it is implementing in uh, Nepal, India, and Bangladesh. So it aims to ensure the riverine communities uphold their rights, build their resilience, and participate in water resource management. And in South Asia, we acknowledge that water governance and water resource management are linked to rather challenging social, political, economic, and administrative constraint. And river is a common pool resource, so we engage uh, government, civil society, NGOs, private sectors, researchers, academics, uh, regional institutes, youths, and the indigenous groups also. Uh, here, I try to put a simplified version of uh, how we engage with these uh, different type of stakeholder uh, in, the, in our water advocacy process. So the process is actually way more interlinked than it is shown here. And Rosa also emphasized on the regional co cooperation, which I did not put here. For example, uh, if you uh, take the issue of sun mining, that's which is a pressing but uh, sensitive issue we have found from the community, which take place near and in the river, eventually accelerate the river erosion and causing causing uh, loss of public assets and loss of biodiversity. So having heavy political influence and high demand of the sand, it cannot be stopped. So we activate our approach in this particular issue. Uh, if we see in the next slide, so uh, Nodiboy took our river meeting, that is an, a specific intervention uh, of TROSA project, and it's a process through which civil society organizations and local vulnerable community collectively work uh, to identify water governance challenges and opportunities at the grassroots level. So, uh, Throughout, through the Northern Group, we uh, build mutual trust and understanding. We uh, build awareness. Uh, we do the collective actions and capacity building of the community and the vice versa also for us. And ultimately, uh, making the community resilient. So through this process, the community capacity to engage, uh, engage with and influence duty bearers is strengthened to secure their uh, water resource rights. Uh, and throughout the Nodi Vatuk, we already have uh, uh, seen the changes uh, within the world, women leadership, and they have resolved illegal sand mining periodically, and they account they made accountable the local governments and they uh, promote, promote the indigenous knowledge in river management. So uh, if uh, in the next slide, uh, we'll see the process of Nodi Vatuk, how it actually uh, goes to the water influencing. So the Nodi Boitok follows a bottom-up approach, starting with monthly meetings at uh, the village level to listen to the stories of the communities living around the uh, river area. Uh, these events are organized by partners. CNRS has been a partner from the very beginning of TROSA in Meghna Basin here. Uh, and uh, the 
the partners use the reflections from the nodi boitrax to forge partnership with other relevant cso's and then they decide whether the issue requires substantiation of evidence before moving forward while also conducting a power analysis of the st stakeholders involved based on that result the most pressing issues uh, that uh, that is common in multiple geographic location uh, and which is actually uh, possible for trosa to tap tap within uh, then uh, like we select the issues for the advocacy and accordingly CSO make an initial influencing plan for the partnership with the community and with time this is escalated uh, escalated to national and basin level uh, and several no networks usually happen in between for coordinated planning and reporting back to the communities on progress of influencing. So, uh, so basically what I do that we actually build capacity of the community to in, to get involved in the water water governance, and we do evidence based advocacy, and we try to uh, tie community that so that they can they are they are able to solve their own problems throughout the process. So this is from uh, my part. So thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Moina and uh, Indu and Moklesh. Um, so as I think the key message was that uh, policies on their own, uh, you know, are not delivering very well. And what is very much required is intervening at both ends to really critically examine why policies are not working and the sectoral uh, lack of coordination between very different and isolated sectoral policies, but also equally important building the agency and capability of marginalized users to be able to demand um, and be engaged in in effectively in the governance of water so um and and we hope that through the research and through engagement with trosa to amd can contribute to this process um i would now maybe like to open the floor for um questions maybe we we can take a couple of questions and then pass it on to the speakers. Uh, sorry, I apologize for the internet uh, issues. Sorry, everyone. Um, sure, I I see your hand up, Manuranjan. Your you you have a question. Can I also request that the questions are short and um, the answers also by the speakers are are short, so we can have more active flowing conversation. Okay, thank you, Deepa. I thought, of course, in Dash's suggestion that uh, I have been listening uh, uh, to this uh, grabbing, land grabbing, canal grabbing uh, problems by the Ellis for a long time. So it, it, it is difficult to solve. So in work progress on uh, of AMD, we have developed the uh, diastrophic dropping technologies or techniques uh, without bothering the canals or other things. But the canals are, are silted up. And you cannot conserve uh, enough water to irrigate uh, entire area, uh, maybe five to ten percent of the area, and there will be again conflict. Who will take water? So better we have developed the residual soil moisture or utilization and rainfall utilization techniques for uh, high value crops in the dry season in, in our zone. That could uh, that could uh, uh, help in in uh, in this uh, water governance issues. I believe. Thanks very much, Panoranjan. So, how technology can be a disruptor for, um, you know, addressing these challenges when they are very complex and critical? Uh, but I can pass this over to uh, Moina and Muklesh yeah. for their comments in yeah. a, in a bit. Maybe let's take two two other questions. Can I can I respond to this uh, alternative way of uh, handling the uh, fresh water? Mokhlesh, can better? you wait just one minute and then we'll okay, take yeah, one sure, more question sure. and then you can respond. Yeah. All okay. Right, um, right, Mary Charlotte, please. Yes. Well, thank you, Holt, for those very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I had work on this uh, issue with Manoranjan, by the way, uh, some some ten years back, and that's kind of. Yes, yeah, striking to see that some of the issues that uh, that we had uh, noticed and analyzed some ten years ago are still are still there. Um, so one specific question, I think we we had came with the idea of the of the role that the union parishad could play 
um, in in between the community uh, level uh, water management and issues they are facing and and the policy level action with with this issue that well maybe the policies are there but on the ground we don't see them um, being being necessarily applied so so we were thinking about empowering the union parish at the local government institution uh, to help with that so I'm just curious to know if there is any step which has been taken in that direction and what is the role that the currently of the of the union parish in terms of uh, water governance. Thanks a lot, Mayor Charlotte. I, I will hand over uh, both the questions first to Moklesh and then to Moina. Uh, all right, thank you, Deepa. Um, the first question is fine. I mean, we appreciate, I think, uh, the technology that without uh, water we can grow crops. But I think um, the way we see is a, is a landscape approach. Not that uh, only the, uh, the production of crops using the water, but water is needed for the captured fisheries, the area, the captured fisheries, the wild species of freshwater is seriously impacted. So we have the evidence that if we excavate a canal or rehabilitate a canal, that this freshwater species, uh, many species that are small and people eat the whole fish, and very nutritious, uh, that they recolonize, they come back. And I have the photo of the testimony that the women, they go to the canal before uh, making their lunch and spend an hour and get, say, half a kilogram of fish. And this is for their lunch and dinner of the family and the free fish. So what we want is a healthy, uh, a production system at the landscape scale where we need we have the land and water and other sort of resources uh, that all collectively actually essential for a healthy production system uh, the other thing is uh, i appreciate that i think in, in, it's not alternative rather uh, in combination we can use that um the other aspect of this union Parishad, basically uh, canal restoration and creation of freshwater provision, it needs money. But the budget they have is not adequate to address all this. I think the allocation from the government is less. That's why, you know, in our previous work in policy briefing notes, develop, when we developed that, we recommended for financing. Uh, financing the uh, these food system uh, initiatives in the impacted area like lower cancer delta and union push as as the points you raised on different projects we excavated separate canals and uh, the support of the union Polish particularly in conflict resolution was instrumental and it was good and uh, in some of the areas, the Union Parishad chairmen are also against canal restoration because they are also party to canal leasing. So it's really uh, very tricky and we need to handle this thing very carefully uh, because there are sensitivities in it. Uh, however, thanks a lot. In those I, I think that's a, yeah, I think that those two are great answers. Did you want to add more? Um, no, it's fine. I mean, yeah, even on Polish engagement is fine, but even on Polish cannot handle the leasing thing. Most of the canals are leased. If we want to cancel the lease, we need to address the local, I mean, the Upazila uh, sub-district administration, district administration, and also the court and Ministry of Land. So things are complicated, not that easy, but doable. Yeah. So that's it from my side. Uh, great. So I, I think you've really answered the question well that the political uh, implications are far more complex than just handing it over to a local government. And also, I think the other question that in the interest of multiple livelihoods and also the biodiversity, there is a need to let these rivers flow through these canals. Um, Moina, did you want to add anything to the first two questions? Then I would like to hand over um, to Maria. Oh, so actually, Dr. Mukles has said it all. Just uh, one experience from Trusa. So, if uh, union, the involvement of union Polisha depends on the 
obviously on the political influence and also uh, what sort of initiative uh, community is taking or community is leading on that topic like if it is not that much of sensitive then union parishad might take uh, might get involved but if it is a sensitive issue then it will be a bit, bit much crucial okay thanks a lot um, maria you have a question i think you might mean me mariana Mariana? Yeah, okay, okay, thanks. Um, Moisha and Moina both uh, talked about evidence, uh, that evidence is relevant of what works better to, for informed adv advocacy. So my question is, what do you consider evidence and how do you generate evidence? And I have a second question for Indu. Uh, as we heard that elite capture is an important area, and I, I heard that... Um, you know, women's exclusion too, and you work on it and you empower it. But how do you work on elite capture so that this is less a barrier? So these are my two questions for all three speakers. Great. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, so um, maybe first, Indu, you can respond to the question and then over again to Mukhlesh and Moina for the first question. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Mariana, for the question. I think uh, the, the first question was about what do you consider an evidence, right? Like it's, um, I think in this particular case study, what we are play, trying to do with the TROSA is that uh, in, for example, particular Nodi Voitox meetings where there will be the participants from the community label, women and marginalized. So. Uh, we want to actually co-create evidence with them, like you know, we are conducting detailed, uh, you know, like the data collection um, to working with these people to see what are the issues that, you know, like that are you know, on the ground in, the, in terms of water governance, not only uh, in terms of the food production, for example, how it affects for different livelihoods and what does that mean? Or what does that access to water mean for different people who are dependent on these uh, common pool water resources. So we would like to generate the evidence together with these people um, that we are trying to do. And in terms of elite capture, like uh, it's like <clears throat> women's exclusion, um, we found that there have been the issues of elite capture and uh, women exclusion. Um, so I think uh, I, I would actually pass this question to Mo over to Mokles, Dr. Mokles from CNRs, because they have been working, you know, like for a long for on these issues on, you know, like how um, they would they see this and what would be the strategy to work uh, with the elite capture uh, on the ground. Uh, maybe over to you, Dr. Mokles. Okay, thank you. Uh, on the elite. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the evidence uh, generation, basically, um, in in part of the Kultuli Tunnel, when we did this rehabilitation maybe four years back. And uh, what we did, we did a kind of GIS based uh, land use survey mapping. And then we saw that, you know, the over the years, the, the cropping diversity and the areas uh, changes uh, uh, because of this water availability and we also engage the uh, uh, agriculture extension department to support the communities on the technical aspects uh, training and we also uh, uh, engage the agriculture extension department to do crop cutting which is just uh, to uh, kind of uh, what sort of production that we got per unit area in our uh, new varieties or stress tolerance varieties that we collected from uh, BD and also PINA, uh, Bangladesh uh, Nuclear uh, Institute of Nuclear Agriculture at Rice Research Institute. Uh, so, so these are the evidences. And also we did the fish catch monitoring in one part of the canal to see what sort of species are there. Uh, but that project was not a research project like CGIAR system. That was a kind of climate justice project. So that's what that we started. And uh, there are evidences that, you know, uh, wa the water availability. Say before we rehabilitate the canal, 
it was seasonal water body and that's why it was not leased because it is dried in the dry season so leaseholder was not interested to take it for fish culture so when we ex we excavated it then it become perennial and can uh, provide uh, water uh, dr bonoranjan is right that you know we need to excavate the whole canal network that takes time and money uh, but well i mean uh, a small scale thing for evidence generation is quite good and our job is not to do everything but to show government that what is possible and how this this food production system can be improved enhanced uh, in this sort of uh, very uh, climate or hazardous place uh, what is possible uh, that you know, government should take the proactive measures to handle this sort of crisis um okay, thanks a lot the uh, elite Mokesh, capture um, elite capture is there and then to evict the elite cap elite people from there or the, those people who grabbed or had you know, kind of illegal control we actually uh, engage we made allies make friends like there are journal, local journalists we engage them in the process there is a local um, youth groups we engage them in the process there is one NGO platform on environmental issues. We engage them. And it's kind of collective force, as I said earlier. I mean, if we have, and also the what Deepa is saying, the agency, what we have seen, the women, I mean, Deepa, I think you could remember uh, Pushmarani Mondol was a young housewife uh, where, you know, we, uh, we were in their uh, house. She's so courageous. She alone with some of our peers evicted, removed the uh, leaseholder from, from the canal. So the house is there, but he left the place. He, the Pushpo said that if you stay here, we will kill you. Uh, with, so uh, well, that person left to adjacent villages, never coming to that point. But he put some agent, but well, I mean, they have the, the, the question is, they understand problem, but unless the external facilitator facilitate and uh, you know help them use their agency to shape up their world, it is difficult for them alone okay. to do. Thanks because a lot, Mokesh. There are more uh, cases. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. So, okay. Thanks. Yeah. I, I think you've made the point really well that water uh, governance is a very political issue, um, especially where it's so contested and where freshwater resources are so scarce. Uh, Moina and Indu, you have your hand up, and I, if this is in relation to the questions, then I would ask you to please take no more than one minute each to add to this, because Manuranjan has his hand up, and I would like to pass on um, to him then for uh, maybe his third question. Uh, okay, so Moina, Indu, one minute each, and then Manuranjan. Yeah, uh, I just want to add uh, in response to the questions of evidence that we start from our learning things back in our, in our mind and then document the impacts from in the ground from the people who are actually suffering. And when needed, we intervene with the citizen science, science approach, uh, create a database and that is added to the uh, relevant expertise, expert inputs. And we TRUSA has actually at least two examples where community initiatives and indigenous knowledge attracts experts from the Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology and Department of Fisheries who actually later take the uh, information and do the research and eventually fi find out that uh, what communities are saying it was it was true. Yeah, that's all for my. Thanks a lot, Moina. Indu, one minute, please. Sorry, I'll be brief here. So I think it resonates with uh, what San, sorry, Moina just mentioned. Like the approach we see here is uh, we'll be working with both CNRS and Oxfam. Um, so documenting this and in terms of elite capture, like once we could create, like develop the knowledge uh, using the TROSA's evidence, we want to focus on two different aspects. So one is uh, making these policy makers institutions you know like the kind of realize sensitization on that there has there is a need to change this policy practice and they're also uh, working on the ground like how we can increase the agency and voice of these different populations like the women smallholders fishers and some other 
a marginalized population. So once we have the evidence, we'll be working with the TROSA uh, using their approach, as Moina just said, and then integrating uh, with their, like, you know, the advocacy campaigning and then at two different levels. One is the institutional level and also at the grassroots, the Nordi Boitok, really to focusing on increasing this agency and capacity and, uh, you know, like the, uh, of those marginalized populations. Um, yeah, maybe if Moina wants to add more, but I just wanted to highlight that uh, yeah. with respect no, to the I, case. No, I think we should not add more. Uh, I think we should pass it on to Manoranjan for the last final question. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Deepa. Uh, you know, uh, this canal grabbing, alley capture, this will be there in Bangladesh because this is a democratic country. Either you bring the Union Prishad or whatever, whose interest is there. So the two issue, issue is the salinity versus non-salinity. Salinity is a resource for the aquaculture. So there will be, uh, there is, a, and it's, it's a curse for the agriculture. So the, this conflict is there, aquaculture versus agriculture, and aquaculture will win because they are the influential people, and that is happening in the Shatkil area. But you will come to the um, uh, Kula area, where salinity is less, where shrimp farming or aquaculture is, is less, uh, profitable, the, the cropping are, are there. That's why in the, in the uh, Dr. Mokilas mentioned that zoning. We are also listening zoning for a long time. But again, I'm telling that it is a, a democratic country. Nobody will believe that zoning or, or obey that. Farmers who have influence, they will do their own way. Uh, so uh, uh, my question is that, uh, uh, or my uh, suggestion is that, wherever the resources are available, for agriculture, aquaculture, we have to indirectly use that one. And if we show the benefit to the community, then there will be some solution. Otherwise, uh, I believe uh, we will have to listen for a long time this grabbing and elite capture like a thieves. Thank you very much. Mukhlech, do you want to add anything uh, very quickly for one minute, please? Okay, Moklesh doesn't seem to be there. Um, so, uh, Moina, do you want to add anything to the recent comment by Manuranjan? No, I, I think it's fine. Uh, I think uh, I don't want to talk, go into debate about the uh, democracy and the autocracy, but I think we need some sort of, you know, systematic approach that you know the enabling uh, landscape environment and in shatkira as well there are areas where shrimp culture is difficult because uh, the watering uh, the shrimp land or shrimp pond from river is not possible or very costly so there are places where agriculture is feasible low cost and profitable so we actually need to think about uh, the the local differentiations or variability of the landscape and waterscape and salinity scape. So uh, yeah, I mean, so that's what I want to say. Okay. But uh, yeah. yeah, thanks Thank a lot, Moklesh. Maybe I can just add very quickly to that and then hand over to Ole for closing this session on time. Um, so i do agree uh, manuranjan that um, there are different values and um, of different types of approaches but i think there's enough documentation on bangladesh that the expansion of um, saline water shrimp cultivation has had very challenging prospects and in fact now the the economic gains from uh, shrimp culture in cultivation in the southern coastal deltas is no longer viable and there is a collapse of this, uh, what used to be earlier, a very thriving economic uh, driver. And in, in the recent uh, documentation on Bangladesh, um, there's also uh, you know, references to looking into new waterscapes and landscapes to, to carry on shrimp cultivation, whether that is a wise decision, given the fact that it had so many outcomes in the southern coastal deltas is another issue. But I think um, it also signals, I think, an issue for 
policies to really take on a much more um, integrated perspective where the consideration of ecological dimensions, longer term economic gains, and also equity are built into what is promoted as livelihood opportunities um, in the food systems um, context more broadly beyond agriculture. So over to you, Ole. I think um, thanks to all the speakers and all the questions. That was really interesting. Yeah, thank you very much also from my side to all the speakers and uh, thanks for a very active discussion. Uh, as always, the recording will be posted on the NFP Connect platform under nfpconnects.com and also we can continue the discussion on that platform. Um, so that, that will happen within the next few days. I would uh, like now to give the last word to Mariana to tell us what we can expect during the next Delta Talks in end of April. Please. Oh, you could be. I don't have the, the, the exact plans for next time. <laughs> so that is uh, uh, that that is to be seen and uh, it's, it will be a nice surprise for all of us. Uh, to hear, I hope soon, uh, who will be the next speakers or speaker, depending. And I, um, yeah, I also would like to thank the, the speakers and the discussion that I really liked. And um, also, um, Ipa's um, plaidoyer for a more integrated perspective. And uh, so that is, I think, what we try through the through the Delta talks also, so that we expose ourselves to different yeah, disciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary approaches people are working on, and then we discuss it together. Uh, people who are working in, in this field or people who are not working in this field. So I think this broadens our views as, as researchers, as we also need to take a more integrated perspective. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody, and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Just putting the camera to say hello to old friends. <laughs> Have a good day. Bye-bye. How are you?